Okay, yeah, okay, super. That's this second microphone. Is it on? There we go. Okay. So, um, technology change has been happening since the dawn of the, uh, of the Industrial Revolution, and it tends to follow an S-curve, where new technology gets introduced. It doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to. It doesn't have all the functionality. All that functionality comes together, and it ramps really fast. Uh, that slow part is when the marginal utility isn't very high. The fast part is when the marginal utility of that technology is great. Then it kind of starts to peak out, and the marginal utility slows down. Okay. Uh, then as that technology epoch ends, uh, a new one comes on. And this is kind of a series of, of S-curves or the long waves of adoption. It's debatable when they start and end, but it's not debatable the shape they take. And it's also not debatable that when one is ending and the next one's starting, you're in the middle of what I'll refer to as churn. Okay? And we're in the middle of churn right now where computing technology as it had kind of manifested itself in its value proposition is beginning to taper off and by itself kind of come to the end of its era. And the new era of distributed intelligence is coming online right now. As that manifests itself in, and there's some books on that, On Scientific Re Revolution by Thomas Kuhn is a good one. Clay Christensen's The Innovator's Dilemma is another good one. Joffrey Moore's the, uh, the Crossing the Chasm is another one that kind of give you some historical context of what you'll encounter as we kind of enter this era of churn. Okay, so at the top left, we have the chart that's used by the Exascale Computing Program to kind of describe the challenge with uh, Exascale Computing, which would be conventional HPC. And the challenge there is that Bernard Scaling ended 10 years ago. We talked a little bit about that in the panel last night. Does everybody know what Denard scaling is? Okay, some people don't. So, or maybe they just don't feel like raising their hands. So you're going to hear about Denard scaling then because not everybody raised their hands. So that's their punishment. So Denard scaling was the magic that happened with Moore's Law that every time we doubled the number of transistors to die, it could go faster. Okay, so not only did the number of transistors go up, but the speed went up at the same time. So Moore's Law is all about transistor density, Denard's scaling was all about the frequency benefit. Unfortunately, leakage entered into the equation pretty heavily at the end of the 90s, and in the early 2000s, it became a real problem, and Denard's scaling, which was the doubling of frequency that you got about when you doubled the number of transistors, that whole phenomenon, that physics phenomenon, ended. And with the ending of Denard's scaling on this chart, which you might not really be able to see, so Moore's law is the, is the magical red line on top. And the frequency per core is the, uh, is the blue line right underneath it. And you see that line flattens off. And you also see the number of cores, which was the uh, black line on the bottom, accelerate dramatically. Okay, so the way that uh, vendors overcame the fact that the cores couldn't run any faster is we added more because we have more transistors. The problem is if you have code that relies on single threaded performance because of Amdahl's law, you have a problem because that part of the code isn't getting any faster. In fact, the frequency of the microprocessors for a CPU are going the other direction. So the, the, the latest CPU from, from Intel is two and a half gigahertz. So the only way you can get advanced performance out of that is to localize your, uh, your single-threaded uh, data in memory. Or you have to parallelize your code. If you parallelize your code, that's wonderful because we are giving you more transistors. GPUs will run a lot faster that way, so will CPUs. That's all good. But some code doesn't lend itself to that. Code like Giant, as an example, uh, is a hard code to take advantage of that. Climate weather simulation is another code, type of code that's really hard to take advantage of parallel computing. Uh, radiation transport, that's the name three, rather important scientific domains that don't really lend themselves to parallel processing very easily. Now, we try to add tools. We try to do a lot of things as vendors to make it easier, but in fact, it's just hard. So as we look at conventional HPC, and, and the reason for the chart on the left is the exascale computing program leads, talking about the fact they're going to have to do software overhaul if they're going to take advantage of exascale. And we're certainly helping that happen. But in some cases, as we've engaged with some of these applications, that software overhaul starts to look like trench warfare, where we lose a lot of bodies every 100 yards of progress we get moving forward with these codes. 
Now, we're going to do that because we've got to get performance out of some of these codes, but it may be limited at uh, 2x, 3x, maybe 4x the CPU or the single threaded performance after a lot of work. So, at the same time, the S curve of, of the computing era is starting to taper off and it becomes harder and harder for conventional HPC codes to take advantage of the underlying processing horsepower. Artificial intelligence or deep learning, which was just discussed in detail before, is coming online. And much like every other time you have historical innovation, we're at the bottom of the S curve for artificial intelligence. It looks really powerful. We've got some great examples I'm going to talk about here in a few minutes but not all of the features and all the functionalities there yet. We're still at the bottom of the S curve. So this is the kind of commentary to the 800 people. So you will get pushback from the people who are on the, who develop their careers on the S curve to the left. If you are on the S curve to the right, they will tell you how the stuff you're doing just won't work. How it just, ah, that'll never go. But just like some executive said about, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, how in the hell can you ever sell a cell phone without a keyboard for 500 bucks? You've got to be kidding me, right? No, oh, the use case changes, right? The, the way that a cell phone, a mobile phone gets used is, is different. So what you start to see is adaptation will happen and the artificial intelligence capabilities will evolve. I mean, we're at the very beginning right now there where we have for HPC technology, we've been at it for 40 years and there's some great stuff there and more great stuff is still yet to come. The other thing that's happening uh, is the emergence of cloud computing. And I saw a lot of talks yesterday uh, and I'm sure we'll hear some more about the way I think this community who pioneered the grid are I think on the forefront within the HPC community of trying to take advantage of some of the cloud technology. I would say embrace that as aggressively as you can. It will make it a lot easier to kind of keep pace with some of the other things that might be slowing down. So we see these kind of three things happening uh, and the opportunity here for us is to take advantage of the change uh, as it's occurring. The other thing that's happening and you folks are right in the middle of, of one of these big experiments which is the high luminosity LHC there's a tremendous volume of data that's coming available to all of the scientific community. So you guys get 10x more with a high luminosity LHC. Eater is going to throw off a ton of data as they get a 30x increase in power. The square kilometer array radio telescope comes online in the next 10 years. It has like 10x increased fidelity and an exabyte a day. We've got personal genomics and cryo-electron cryo microscopy technology which is coming online in the area of biology. So there's all this rich high fidelity data which historically might have been a problem because how are we going to process all that data? But artificial intelligence loves lots of data. In fact, the more labeled high quality data we have, the better the results of a neural net. So one of the things that might have been inhibiting the capability of this new technology would have been the availability of, of, uh, of high quality data and there will be a lot of it which I think otherwise would have been problematic. So based on the panel yesterday, when, you, when I start to talk about AI and the vendors talk about AI, there's a feeling like we're all AI. Like, well, you forgot about HPC, Tom. I said, well, no, I started my career at HPC. I wrote my first program in 1978 on batch cards. Okay, I, I, I love HPC. And actually, I, I kind of like Fortran too, but you know, uh, you need to move on. And uh, we certainly need to move on from batch cards. But HPC is great because the algorithms that I worked on back in the late 70s and early 80s got refined. Runga Kutta algorithms got a lot better. HPC got refined and adapted. And there's phenomenal results that you get from codes like Giant, Genie, uh, the Cactus Astrophysics Simulation. I mean, the list goes on. There's 2,500 applications in HPC. And they do phenomenal physical representation of the universe in silico. That's tremendous. But there's some limitations with HPC, not the least of which is its batch-oriented nature. So there's a strong capability with, with AI, which is coming online. We've got new methods that handles large volumes of data really well. And the early results show that we can get increased accuracy, increased stability, and not just two, three, four, five X increases in performance, but two, three, four, five orders of magnitude increases in performance. So if we couple these two together, I think we have a real powerful set of tools to, to tackle some of the big problems in science. 
like understanding the standard, standard model, developing commercially viable fusion energy, understanding the origins of the universe. I mean, these are the grand challenges of science that I think, in one hand, even if Denard scaling didn't end, you would still want to see the application of artificial intelligence. So in some ways, this may actually be a bad thing, creating an opportunity for us to do things that as a community we might not otherwise do if we could still write crappy code and get 2x performance benefit every two or three years. So one of the changes, and I think this is a big one as we, as we look at the introduction of AI and HPC, and this is actually a model I take from Rick Stevens. Some of you may know Rick. He's a principal investigator with the DOE at Argonne. He built this slide set to talk to other people in the DOE who were sort of confused about AI and how it really worked with HPC. So traditional HPC systems work in a batch mode. This red, red square kind of describes a large-scale simulation. It would run maybe a little tiny bit of analytics would run on that machine, and then all of the analytics were done offline. What we're beginning to see happen is scalable data analytics are penetrating into that red square, and artificial intelligence is emerging. Largely, where the examples that I'll give here in a few minutes uh, that some of the people in this room have actually executed um, that AI work is normally done outside of the big HPC data center system. Usually it's a cluster on the side. Uh, that's because if you put some of these deep learning training algorithms on a CPU-only supercomputer, there'd be no CPU-only supercomputer left for anybody else. So that's done offline on, on, a, on a different system. However, what's starting to happen is people need to get on the big systems. So what, we, what Rick sees, and I kind of draw this as a cloud as opposed to a square, is a cloud environment emerging around the traditional HPC systems. Large-scale simulation is still going to be fundamental to the scientific progress, but you're going to see these other domains integrated in a workflow that, I, that will couple all three together. And I think one of the first HPC systems that manifests this is the Bridges system at Pittsburgh. Anybody familiar with that? Pit yeah, okay, right. So that system, they never run the top 500 on that. They don't give a shit about how fast Linpack runs, right? They don't even care, right? Uh, which sort of bums us out because we want to see the top 500 number. But anyway, what really matters about Bridges is their system is tuned for each of these three workloads. So part of the system is tuned for AI. It has big memory CPU nodes and, and GPU nodes. It has CPU-only nodes, and it has GPU nodes that are, that are, that are uh, organized for, uh, for the traditional HPC workload all in the same system. So the idea is the file system is all connected to the same overall system, but the individual nodes are tuned for the different kinds of workflow. And uh, we talked about heterogeneous systems last night. This is not only the nodes are heterogeneous, but the architecture of the nodes within the system are heterogeneous yet again. And it's really tuning the system for the, for the desired workflow. And that is happening now. So, the talk uh, just before me from, uh, from Daniel was a deep dive into deep learning. Um, and what I want to talk about now is kind of up-leveling how are we seeing the taxonomy evolve for the convergence of HPC and AI. So the, there, are three there are three use cases that are emerging. Um, these kind of collapse some other use cases underneath them. But overall for all three of these, which would be modulation, augmentation, and transformation for us, is uh, simulated data and experimental data are combined and used to train a neural network. The resulting inference engine is then applied in these three different ways. The one way is modulation. So here you've got a trained inference engine. In many cases, the examples are trained with uh, simulated data, which is great because it's labeled and it, it's already, you know, it represents, you know it represents the physics because you ran the simulation. <laughs> so you actually develop the simulation ideally to train, uh, to train the neural net. Once it's trained, you can then use the inference engine, which typically runs as accurately but orders of magnitude faster, in between other simulation runs. So typically what's done is in a Monte Carlo type sweep is you'll run the same simulation with different input parameters over a wide range of possible options and then look at the envelope of data to see what might have happened physically. In this case, what happens is as opposed to running the full simulation each time, you'll run a high resolution version of the simulation a few times and in between that you'll run the inference engine or the, the neural net uh, 
in place of that. So it's not like we got rid of the simulation. In fact, you need the best simulation performance possible to train the, to train the neural net, and then you still use it as part of the overall scientific discovery process. Augmentation is where you would take that neural net and embed it in the existing simulation. So you could conceive of an application like Giant, which has some semi-empirical parts in it already. If those happen to be computationally intensive, replace those with the inference engine. So you're still running the full simulation, but inside of that simulation, you're running the, the neural net where it, where it made sense. Um, this hasn't been done at large scale yet, but it's really intriguing, again, because of the trench warfare that some of the developers are engaged in right now with things like climate weather simulation, which are really hard to make uh, progress with, uh, given the nature of those codes. Uh, rather than throw the whole code out or simply use it as training, uh, use it in conjunction with the neural net in a more integrated way. Um, we haven't really, I don't have a, an example for that, but it's one that we're investigating now. Transformation is one where we actually couple the batch-oriented training type or the, the long-scale training uh, application with the inference engine in a live, either clinical environment or in an experimental environment. So, uh, so that's transformation. And the reason I think that's really important is because, uh, and I'll get to this a little bit later, in many cases, uh, funding sources, when they look at high-performance computing, kind of don't get it. They don't see why high-performance computing is important because it ha happens off somewhere. And the batch oriented simulation happens, and then somebody goes and gives a paper talk, and it's like, well, it's kind of disaggregated from uh, real uh, either clinical delivery in the case of medicine or, or the delivery of uh, a better product. This example uh, is multi-messenger astrophysics. So what I'm going to do now is give a survey result. This is going to go fast because I only have 10 minutes, and many of the people that did this work are here. Uh, but I want to give you a survey of what's possible with the convergence of HPC and AI. So multi-messenger astrophysics is one of the 10 big ideas at the National Science Foundation. The idea here is you couple the LSST optical telescope with maybe a space-based optical telescope, SKA, and a gravitational wave observatory. And you then hear gravitational waves and look to see if you can't see optical phenomena that might have been a res the, the result of two, or the follow, the following result of the physical phenomena that would, would result when two black holes collide. So today, that's intractable because the way the LIGO experiment, which is the gravitational wave observatory, processes data is like CERN. They have a trigger type mechanism at the source. Once that filtered data is processed, it's then sent off to a grid. The grid processes the data, and about a week later, huh, a discovery happens. We saw a gravitational wave. Einstein was right. Everything's great. People go get a Nobel Prize. That's wonderful, but you couldn't really control an optical telescope a week and a half later with the result that happened at the Texas Advanced Computer Center on their supercomputer system. So what the folks did at NCSA is they, they took a simulation. Uh, it does not run on a GPU because it's one of those simulations like Giant and the climate weather simulation that's very hard to parallelize. It's called Cactus. They developed a training data set with that and then applied that uh, to uh, uh, NeuralNet. Uh, the NeuralNet, uh, which framework did they use? I forget the framework. So they, they have the commercial office. Oh, they used MXNet because uh, it's Wolfram's down the street. So they used MXNet. They trained a neural net. Um, they then took that and, and applied it and compared it to the uh, parameter waveform matching. So the uh, performance of the neural net is 100 times faster than the CPU on another CPU. It's 4,750 times faster on a P100. Now, uh, yesterday in one of the talks, somebody got a little grumpy because the GPU was being compared probably unfavorably to a lower power CPU. Uh, that's, that's a fair, actually, that's a fair complaint. In the case of 4,750 times faster, I don't care. Give me the fastest CPU out there. Maybe it's 10 times faster, so it's only 475 times faster. Still, it goes in under, uh, under 6 milliseconds, and that's fast enough to execute in real time. So this kind of shows the promise of, of what could be done. And actually, the other thing is this is done in, with the time domain data, and it can, encounters, it comprehends all nine parameters, where the pattern waveform matching has to throw away parameters because it can't compute them fast enough. So that's multi-messenger astrophysics. I won't talk about this one in detail because Michaela and her whole team are here. 
They did this work with Giant. It's a similar approach. They took Giant. Uh, they trained a neural net. Uh, they took that trained neural net and compared the performance and stability to, to the original Giant code. Obviously, this is a simplified version of Giant. This isn't a full-scale run. People that were you know, deeply into the, the simulation would point out a number of things that this doesn't do. But what it does do, <laughs> it does really fast. So they used 18 K80s to train the neural net. Is Michaela or anybody here, to, how long did that training take? I don't have that. Take a few hours to do the training. Once it's trained, the neural net runs like really fast. <laughs> it's like it's another five orders of magnitude, in this case, faster. So it's more than 4,750. It's five orders of magnitude faster than the, uh, than the original simulation, depending on the batch size. So there's a lot of qualifiers here. You know, by no means is this absolutely conclusive that we throw Giant away and do everything with neural nets. On the other hand, it shows promise that a neural net could be used in concert with a full fidelity simulation and add some significant value. I'm going to skip ahead to this one. This example does a similar thing. So in chemistry, which I think some people are chemists here, even though this is a physics, <laughs> largely a physics com conference, there are some chemists here. So in chemistry, molecular dynamics is used um, for pharmaceutical drug design, as well as a number of other interesting and exciting things. Um, and full-scale chemistry simulations generally aren't used because they would take like forever. So one of those full-scale those full chemistry applications delivers point-level data was used to create a database. That point-level data was then aggregated and used as training data. That training data was used to construct a neural net. You kind of, you've seen this model now before. The neural net actually uh, was used in place of a molecular dynamic simulation. So the colon and chemistry simulations are a higher fidelity. This was used for the type of simulation that's used for the drug design, which is lower fidelity because of the time it takes to execute. In this case, it's a million times faster than the molecular dynamic simulation and more accurate than the molecular dynamic simulation, but not as accurate as the DFT raw quantum chemistry code. So again, this is another thing I'm sure people in this domain could probably point out a number of things this doesn't do, and I'm sure it doesn't do them all. We're at the bottom of the S curve. This is going to get better. It's a million times faster. Actually, this was work was done by people in this room. This was the first example I saw that was published or publishable. Uh, were a neural net, in this case, a neural net that looked very similar to the image type processing neural nets that were used in commercial space was applied to a real physics problem. Not only did it get the right answer, it got a much better answer than the uh, support, is this a support vector me method? I, the, the machine learning method that had been applied, which I think was an SVM, uh, essentially it's 33% more accurate, which in the words of the, the uh, associate director of Fermi said, well, you know, this is, you know, 30% less number of tons that I need to buy for the next experiment. These experiments are huge, right? I mean, I think the Nova experiment would fit between the towers of London Bridge. So to get more fidelity, you'd have to build a much bigger simulation. This would be 33% less of that you would have to build. And I know this is super attractive for the folks that are doing Dune because that's an even bigger experiment, and these are really expensive, and being able to get more value out of them is kind of a no-brainer. There's some work in progress that's happening, and this is climate weather. Climate weather simulation for fog detection is way outside of the bounds of the current uh, simulations because the microclimate where fog really happens is way inside the two kilometer by two kilometer resolution those, those simulations are capable of. They're using those along with some other experimental data to see if they can't do better at uh, the Zurich airport. If this works, this could be pretty exciting. This is a work in progress, it's not done. A similar approach is being used for earthquake prediction. So here are the earthquake codes, again, run in batch, batch mode. They actually run on GPUs. They run great on GPUs. It just they run great on GPUs for like a couple of days. So being able to use that in conjunction with earthquake prediction is only good for building the training data set. What's being done here is some of that data, along with uh, some seismometers, which are being placed on utility meters in Southern California, are being used and experimented with things like Shazam for earthquakes. So if you're familiar with the way Shazam works, the little micro tremblers that would be going, you know, being collected off the, uh, uh, off the uh, seismometers would go into uh, a cloud-like system, be compared against the waveforms that are seen there, and, and detect that a, an earthquake would be possible. This is still a work in progress. Obviously, if this works, this would be, this along with the weather simulation at that level would be, you know, have huge benefits. 
I included one slide on our product. And all I really want to say about it is we, we embed all this great CUDA stuff underneath here so you don't have to worry about that. And the beauty in AI is we include then a number of things that work with the commercial off-the-shelf training networks. We are also building out capability that are looking at the different use cases. The beauty is that all this stuff for us is the same. It's the same GPU in the, automotive car, in the autonomous car as is in the data center system that we would be using to, uh, to simulate the quantum chemistry or, or particle physics. So we can reuse a lot of that technology. Um, and we're real excited to get your feedback on how this all works. Um, but we're real excited about the capability that this, this SDK gives. And we're embedding this in a cloud-like repository that we've been available to this community probably in the next uh, quarter. This is it. So <laughs> this is the normal close, but you know, I want to ask answer Ian's question. So as I was thinking about what I would tell the 800 people, I would close, close with this comment from Robert Noyce, who is the founder at Intel. And at the close of the new hire training, uh, there was a, his, his famous quote was, don't be encumbered by history. Go out and do something wonderful. More questions? Let me get us back on track. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Many thanks. Um, so we continue with the last talk of the session.